Hello anyone and welcome back to the Great Ace Attorney, where I think we're finally getting to the end of this hacking game. It's taken me ten years, but here we are. Oh boy, this series went off the rails a very long time ago, but what can you do? Now, let's see how this is gonna end. And it may not even end this time, who the heck knows, but we're gonna see. For now, what's in the box? So this is the article in question, is it? The small box deposited with the pawnbroker by Mr. McGill did two months ago. And on the night of Mr. Winterbank's murder, the only item on the shelves that was touched by whoever broke into the shop. Quick, quick! Let's open it and see what's inside! Yeah, that figures. Good gracious, this is no ordinary box, it seems. Wow. Although in truth, I had an inkling that might be the case. I mean, how obvious did you need it to be? It would appear that the box houses a miniature music box movement. Then, is it too much to expect? I think it would be reasonable to assume that it is a device for the playback of this disc, my lord. So here we have the means to play back Mr. McGilded's disc, deposited at Winderbanks at much the same time. Not strictly correct, my lord. It was not McGilded's disc. It was the disc of his victim in the omnibus. But why, for heaven's sake? I mean, that's what we all want to know, frankly. Are we to understand that the brickmaker was trying to sell this music box disc to Mr. McGilded? I believe the answer will become clear if we listen to the music on the disc, my lord. Yes, very well. Let the court now listen to this curious disc at last. Hold it! Wait, my lord! Good grief, what is the meaning of this, Inspector? The music box and the disc are, um, well, they're unrelated to the case. No, no need to spoil the sombre atmosphere in the courtroom with some silly bit of music. Objection! Okay, what is going on here, Gregsley? This disc may very well have motivated. Motivated? <laughs> See what happens when I try and read quickly. This disc may very well have motivated the culprit, in this case, to commit murder. Try not to mix up words, CA. Clearly, there's every chance that it's fundamentally important to understanding what happened. The prosecution has no objection. But, but no! That piece of evidence is police property now! You can't... Clearly Scotland Yard has some vested interest here. But it is policy of this prosecutor to leave no avenues unexplored. And you, Inspector, have no jurisdiction here to prevent that from happening. Ah! No further delays, please. Play the disc. Well, either this is a very broken music box, or that's Morse code. W what on earth? That's certainly not what I would call music. No. It's just the same note playing over and over again in an irregular sequence. Which, for the record, is not how music boxes should work with the disc with the things where they are, but... I'll just not mention that too loudly. Hmm. Oh, we reached his witness breakdown. Mr. Graydon? This, this really is priceless. After all that, the music box is broken. Broken? It, it can't be, can it? Well, obviously. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if the officer sent to fetch it didn't drop it on the way back to the courtroom. Well, with much regret, I feel the court must accept that this music box offers little in the way of clues. Are you ready to move on, counsel? 
Come on! Yes, all right. It doesn't sound as though... It's, it does sound as though it's completely broken, but is it? Could this music emanating from the music box possibly be a new clue? I mean, obviously, we've come this far. I believe that it could be relevant, my lord. Good lord. But, but how can it be? It's an abomination, council. No noise. I failed to see how it can have any meaning whatsoever. I feel like people might have said that about my commentary. Not gonna lie. It does sound strange, I agree. But there's one thing bothering me. Well, Graydon stands there chortling victoriously. The inspector beside him has a rather telling expression on his face. It's as if Gregson recognises the sound, as if he's familiar with it somehow. And that's making him appear extremely on edge. If that's the stance of the defence, my friend, answer me this. Oh. Just what relevance do you propose this woeful chiming has on this case? It's the defence's belief that the sound emanating from this music box is... Yeah, not supposed to be music. Just because this is a music box, it doesn't necessarily mean the sounds we're hearing are music. Look at that, the smile vanished from Graydon's lips as soon as I said it. I mean, he's a communications officer, come on. We literally have had someone talking about Morse code on the jury during this trial. How is she not yelling about it? I'm on the right lines here, I must be. He? Making deductions based on how people react to what you say? You're acting just like Hurley, Runo. Objection! The sound we're hearing aren't necessarily music. Well, now that you've told us what they are not. I'm sure the court would like to hear what they are. Do enlighten us, my friend. Well, um... Surely you have an idea in mind? Because if not... It will be the death of your ill-formed argument. Exactly. The music box is clearly broken. Refusing to accept that fact is pure foolishness. They've got me. I don't know what the answer is. Yet. Oh, come on. Um, Bruno? I've just examined the music box very thoroughly. And I'm fairly certain that it's not broken at all. Really? Really? The way it's been made, it can only produce a single note anyway. Okay, so that is how music boxes work. Well done. Just in the image they showed of it, it looked like the comb had different notes. Anyway, thank you, Iris. Yeah, my bad. Alright, well, if the music box isn't broken, it must mean that the sounds it's producing have some significance that isn't musical. Ah! Could it be? Is that what these sounds are? Something's just struck me, Runo. I feel like recently, in the past few hours even, I've heard another sound very much like the one this music box makes. Yep. Yes, it's a familiar sound. Actually, Iris, I was just thinking exactly the same thing. I'm going to have to press the defence for an answer. If your assertion is that the music box produced by the sound... Ugh, why can't I read today? What the heck? If your assertion is that the sound produced by this music box is not in fact music at all... Then what the devil is it, Council? All the evidence we've seen so far... All the testimony we've heard... It's all pointing to one single answer now. Prosecution demands that my learned friend presents proof now. Tangible proof of this latest wild speculation. Alright then. <laughs> I love how chill that was. This could be the best chance I'm going to get to fight back in this trial. And if I'm right, it's going to join all the dots together. The evidence that explains the true nature of the sounds on this music box disc is... Uh... 
Well, I don't have anything on here that's actually helpful, but... Does this mention anything about it being leaked by Telegraph? I mean, this is the only thing I can think of that's relevant without presenting the juror who has the Morse code thingy. Take that! Okay, it's wrong. Or maybe not. Today's paper, Council. The headline is Pawnbroker Perishes in Pick Purse Plunder. Hardly supportive of your cause. Uh, no, my lord. I was hoping you'd look a little further down the page. Further down? Ministry Mole? Classified secrets may have been leaked overseas from Ministry of Justice. Yes, this is a very serious matter being investigated at the highest level, I understand. I have heard that international transmissions along supposedly secure lines are somehow being intercepted and leaked to various other countries. And presumably, those transmissions are in the form of wired telegrams. There we go. Of course. Juror number five, your input, please. Stop. Oh, m me, sir? Whatever is the matter? You told the court before that you worked at the same communication station as Mr. Graydon, did you not? Y yes that's correct. And the particular station where you work deals with government communications and newspaper reports. I mean, I put this together how many hours ago? But that's Ace Attorney for you. Sometimes it just happens. Oh yes, we're not your run-of-the-mill communication station at all. Our work is extremely important. Then tell me, is this not a very familiar sound? Hmm? You, you don't mean to say, is it? That's right, madam. It bears more than the passing resemblance to the sound made by your telegraph machine as you tap it. I believe it's called Morse code. But I don't believe it. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but when it comes to leaking telegrams from government departments, there could be nobody more perfectly placed than a highly skilled communications officer. Yeah, get him! Uh, are you suggesting that the music box disc contains stolen government secrets in Morse code? That's exactly what I'm suggesting. Please everyone, order! But this, this is... This is High Treason Council, deserving of capital punishment! Too much new vocabulary. What is this treason? And what is capital punishment? The sorts of words I'd half expect you to know. For our sovereign government's confidential information, hostile nations would surely pay almost any price. Yes, and on that night two months ago, that was the very negotiation that was taking place inside the omnibus. But in the end, McGill did perished and the all-important disc lay unclaimed in the pawnbrokery. My word! In which case? Whoever stole that information in the first place must surely have been beside himself with worry. Because if the disc were to be discovered before it found its way out of the country, it would reveal an act of high treason punishable by death. So the culprit had no choice but to retrieve it. And in order to do that, he would have to gain entry to the pawnbrokery illegally in the middle of the night. Because the article left behind by Mr. McGillard would incriminate him too much if it got into the wrong hands. Isn't that right, Mr. Graydon? You... you think I've been stealing government secrets? Preposterous! Absolutely preposterous! So, in response to the defence's accusation, you claim complete innocence, do you? Well, of course I do! I've had to stand here in silence while that pretentious foreign lawyer has been prattling away! Objection! Then, by all means, counter the charges, sir. The prosecution demands that the witness testifies in response to the accusations brought by the defence. 
delighted, I'm sure. Yeah, sounds like it. The witness is reminded that the crime under scrutiny in this trial is the murder of the pawnbroker, Mr. Winderbank. That being a most flig- Flagitious? The heck does flagitious mean? Offence, for which the law of this land sanctions a capital punishment. But the heinous act of high treason is no less serious a crime. I urge you to bear that in mind as you testify, Mr. Graydon. I wonder if he's going to admit to killing Mr. Winderbank to get out of the high treason charge, but that would kind of both end the same way, so not much point. So then, let us proceed. Oh, you may- Uh... Okay? Didn't see this coming, but you gotta let us have a rabbit and paw cake, governor. We got things to say. I- I beg your pardon? What do you, do you think you are? Name's Nash Skulkin. Occupation is professional baddie. Name's Ringo Skulkin, but we ain't baddies enough to sell out our motherland. That's right, we're what they call... The Three Skulkin Brothers. Bad timing, fellas. Very bad timing. Okay, this could be fun. I'm a communications officer couldn't possibly steal confidential government information. Besides, the sounds produced by that music box aren't even Morse code. It was some low-cost brickmaker negotiating with Begilded anyway, was it not? I've no relation to the man. Look, all we done is break into the gaffy and night like we were- what you told us to do. Had we known there was dodgy government secrets involved, we wouldn't have touched it. Well, their edition was fairly pointless, but thank you. Um, Mr. and Mr. Skulkin. Well, Mr. will do, Governor. What's up? We're Skulkin and Skulkin. Do I take it that you now admit to the crime? That on the night in question, you did indeed gain entry to the premises illegally. And moreover, you did so as a party of three in collaboration with Mr. Graydon here. We did, Gav, we did! Apparently that was an admission so shocking it crashed the capture card. Quieten down, please. What do you say to that, Mr. Graydon? I have no idea what these two ruffians are referring to. You little rotter getting us mixed up in all this monkey business. You never said nothing about no government secrets. It was supposed to be a straight up job. What about the geezer whose shop it was, eh? Poor old bloke didn't have to die, did he? Ugh. Nice to know who your friends are. Whatever these men say, I deny the accusations. Indeed. Well, I certainly wasn't expecting this little music box to become so significant in the proceedings. However, as it has, I will admit it into the court record as evidence. Are we going to get anyone to transcribe it? I mean, I guess it's probably not great to have government secrets read out in the courtroom, but I really want to know. I presume we might need that for this cross-examination then, uh, but first let's give it a look. See how the Fuma Gilded disc sits in the music box the man deposited at Winderbanks? It couldn't be a more perfect fit. So there's no question then. The disc was designed to be played in this music box. Yet despite that, the sounds it produces are neither musical, nor do they appear to have any meaning. It just doesn't make any sense. I wonder... If perhaps there's more to this music box than meets its eye. Perhaps we haven't discovered all its secrets yet. I do want to flick this switch. This is the mechanism that turns the bumps on the disc into sound, isn't it? Yes, the movement. It's all thanks to the comb with its teeth that are plucked by the passing bumps. Usually, the teeth on the comb are different lengths, so that each one produces a different tone. But this comb is very strange. All the teeth are exactly the same length. Well, what does that mean? It means that no matter which tooth is plucked by the passing bumps, the music box will make the same sound. I've never seen a music box like it before. 
Yes, it is strange. A music box that can only play a single note. There has to be some significance to that, surely. I mean, that much we already figured out, let's face it. Is this a suspicious button? Oh! What is it, Bruno? I've, I've just noticed something about this music box. It looks like the bottom of it opens up as well. Ah, oh, you're right! Well, come on then, what are you waiting for? Let's open it! Alright then, here goes. Oh, it's double-sided. Hello. Look at that, there's another movement on the underside. So, does that mean you can set another disc to play back on this side? Yes, I think so. And it looks like the two movements are linked together. They're linked. So if you had two discs, they would both play back at the same time. Oh yeah, because they were looking for a second one, weren't they? Huh. Huh. Who'd have thought there would be a second movement on the underside of the box? And this movement is like the other one. The comb's teeth are all the same length. So this movement also only produces a single tone, like the other one. Yes, it must do. Except that the length of the teeth on the two combs isn't the same. So the single tone produced by this movement will be different to the single tone we've already heard. Okay. What? Basically, each movement can only produce a single note. But the notes they produce are different. A music box that can only play two tones. Okay. Was that not added to the information? Would be nice if it had been. Well, I guess not. Let's go through the testimony then. Maybe I was meant to discover that later. Loud sighing noises. Ace Attorney's got to Ace Attorney, I guess. Let's get pressing for now. Hold it! So is this newspaper headline accurate? Government communications are being intercepted. How could I possibly know? What do you mean by that? Any important government communications are handled by high-level officers, by specialists. General members of staff in the station where I work would never be interested with sensitive information. Okay then, juror, would you like to say something? Let me guess. Juror number five. We regular communication stations officers aren't as lowly as you're being led to believe. A team of us are responsible for setting up and testing the telegraphs used by the Ministry. And Mr. Graydon is the team leader. That's fascinating. Graydon is a highly skilled operator, currently in presence of Idol. Oh dear. Hmm, so you had access to the equipment used for these confidential communications, Mr. Graydon. I cannot read today. What is happening? Well, what of it? The transmissions are always made behind closed doors so they can't be heard. But in any case, all messages are sent and ciphered. Normal employees can possibly understand them. Oh no, must say something. Mr. Graydon regularly attends meetings with Ministry Technicians and the Ministry Communications team. He assists them in ensuring that there are no errors in important internal communications. And he's received the top prize at the Cypher Cracking Convention five years in a row now. That's fascinating. Yeah, we get it, you love him. Well, your idol would appreciate it if you keep your mouth shut. She should really pick her idols more carefully. I, I tell you, this lawyer's accusations are completely unfounded. I mean, I'm kind of assuming that the Skullkins are more likely to break, but we may as well go through in order. They're not? If anyone with a brain, that would be blatantly apparent on listening to that music box for even a few seconds. Of course, of course. Surely it can't be that my learned friend is unfamiliar with Morse code. Who is familiar with Morse code? I mean, I guess lots of people are, but really not me. Ouch, he looks genuinely shocked at my ignorance. Ah. I would be more than happy to demonstrate the basics for you, sir. A, a lesson here in court? 
Morse code is a continuous series of two distinct notes. I mean, I do know the Morse code for SOS, but I think most people know that. Tones, you say? Yes, a short dot and a long dash. By combining those in different ways, you construct letters. Oh, so one side's the dot and one side's the dash. We've got the dashes but not the dots, I bet, because it's the longer comb. Okay, I see what you're doing. I see. For example, this is A, and this is B. But when you listen to the sound produced by this music box, you only hear one tone, don't you? But, but it sounds so similar. The rhythm of it is the same in everything. But there's no discernible meaning to this apparently random sequence of sounds. Is that a text? No one texts me. What's going on? Uh... Okay. Never mind. But there's no discernible meaning to this apparently random sequence of sounds. So your assertion is fundamentally flawed. This is not Morse code. No! <laughs> really, you shouldn't be so surprised. What did I tell you? That music box is nothing but a worthless piece of scrap. Perhaps you might consider studying your subject matter before casting aspersions in the future. Ugh, stop. Nothing to say but stop. Oh, it's so frustrating, isn't it? Iris? I mean, if the government secrets were somehow being leaked using music box... So many other things would slot into place so nicely. Yes, there is. You just won't let me acknowledge it. There's still every possibility that this music box was instrumental in the leaking of government secrets. That's the belief of the defence, at least. Does it please you in some way, my friend, to repeat the same line of argument ad infinitum? It's already been established that to be Morse code, two tones are required. Dots. And dashes. Yes, I'm well aware of that. Then what? Well, it would appear the defence has a hypothesis to put forward. You had better present your idea at once, Council. How do you propose that this music box, which appears to produce only a single tone, could have been used to cipher secret messages into Morse code? You're going to make me go through this again. Great. Be right back when I'm done. Got it. Good gracious, what am I looking at here? Another movement on the underside of the music box. What? It appears, my lord, that the two movements are linked together. In other words, you can put two discs in this music box. And the sounds will both play and the sounds of both will play back at the same time. Good heavens. As the court has heard, Morse code comprises of two tones, a short dot and a long dash. With a second disc in place, this music box could be used to generate Morse code and convey a message. This is beyond a joke. I'm sorry. This poor excuse for a lawyer has absolutely no evidence to support his claims. No, of course. If my friend were able to present the court with the second disc, that would be another matter. Well... I... I can't at the moment. Hmm. And may I remind the court that as the witness has pointed out... He was not the one in the omnibus with Mr. McGilded two months ago, striking a deal over the disc or discs. Indeed, that was Mr. Mason, the brickmaker. Exactly! I had nothing whatsoever to do with it! Though it has holes, I must admit the argument presented by the defence has much promise. I believe the cross-examination should continue. The link between Graydon and the victim of the omnibus case must be there somewhere. 
What notes do we have on the omnibus case? I know that we have them. <laughs> I mean, the only new information we have here is that his surname is Milverton. So I wonder if that'll become relevant at some point. But I haven't found it yet. Oh dear, it looks like you need to give your argument more strength, Runo. You will reiterate your testimony if you please, Mr. Graydon. If I must, though I maintain exactly what I did at the start of this pointless cross-examination. So two months ago in that omnibus, Miguel had killed the brickmaker and stole that disc. Mr. Mason was a single man with almost nothing to his name. It seems he lived in an art sun quarter some years ago, but people there remember little about him. That doesn't make much sense though, does it? How would a humble brickmaker come to acquire secret government information? How oh, indeed. There must have been somebody else involved behind the scenes in all of this. Somebody who acquired the disc and gave it to Mr. Mason. In order to take it to the meeting with McGilded and negotiate a deal. Dear me. You may have it in for me, sir, but I assure you, I have far more class than that. An old brickmaker from Nartistan Quarter in this well-to-do communications officer. If only I could find some evidence to link the two of them together. If you have nothing more to add on that note, let's return to the witness testimony. So I assume I'm going to get some evidence during this that I will link to that statement. Hold it! I don't know if I already have it though. Like Mr. Graydon told you to do, you mean? That's it, yeah. Who else, eh? Silly me, thought he was just popping over for an hour after all them years, but the writer had a dodgy job for us. Eh, Ash? Let me stop you there, Mr. Skulkin. After all them years, you say? Do you mean to tell me that Mr. McGraden is an acquaintance of yours? We're the sociable kind of baddies, you know. Sure, let's say Graydon's an old China. Excuse me! Is something wrong, Mr. Skulkin? Aye? No, the other Mr. Skulkin. What? Who, me? When your brother was testifying just now, he said something that seemed to cause you to react. Oh, I was just remembering the old days, that's all. We used to have a right old laugh together way back when. Together with Mr. Graydon, you mean? Yeah, with Ash. I mean, you look like him. You look at him now in his fancy whistle and flute and you wouldn't add him and Eve it. Can we stop with the Cockney rhyming slang, please? I'm tired. Also, where are they getting fruit? When he was younger, he was from the poor part of town, just like us. Is that so? He was always a leery one. He had the brains. He had the savvy. Always coming up with smart ideas like what would never have gone for our heads. God blimey, ain't that the truth? Remember Milverton and Skulkin's milk run? That was a corker, eh? Save it until after the trial. Your reminiscing has no place in this courtroom. And neither does your fruit. Oi, the geezer asked us a question, didn't he? And we was answering. Yeah, we ain't done nothing wrong. Not in the last five minutes, no. Nevertheless, the court is not prepared to accompany you on your trip down memory lane. Council, can we turn our attention back to the testimony, please? I don't know. Could that sentimental story be relevant somehow? I mean, it won't hurt to add it to the testimony. Unless it does, but... My lord. Yes, Council. The brother's last sentimental statement could hold vital information relating to this case. Very well, Council. Oh wait, a Milverton. Yeah, that was it. I'll permit the brothers to supplement their testimony with that detail. Briefly, I hasten to add. Say no more. The Skulkin's never Skulkin. I'm sure I'm going to regret asking, but 
What exactly was that? Some kind of business? Just a little scheme we had going back when we was youngsters. A bit of fun, really. Delivering fresh milk to locals, that's what it was all about. That sounds alarmingly legitimate. There must be a catch. I suppose since we're here, I should ask them to elaborate. But on what? Business name... So this business was just a bit of fun, you say? And it was just yourselves and Mr. Graydon involved? Yeah, that's it. Milverton and Skulkin's milk run, was it? Yeah, that's it. And where did the Milverton part come from? Oh, right. I thought a clever clog like you'd have worked that one out. That's is <laughs> Enough of this. How much longer are we expected to listen to this drivel? Objection. Let me guess, you don't accept anything these two witnesses are saying? Tell me, why is it that it was only at the mention of the name Milverton that you decided to interject? But because I will. You weren't the happiest homes that one came from. Yeah, his old man was struggling for money so much, his wife walked out on him. She did the name Graydon then, see? Ash will always be Milverton to us. Milverton. So that used to be your surname, did it? Of course not. This is all bunkum. I've been a Graydon since I was born. Do you really think that you can rely on the testimony of these two thieves, hmm? You're a communications officer attached to the civil service. As such, your personal details will have been thoroughly checked at the time of your appointment. It would be a very simple matter indeed to subpoena those records, Mr. Graydon. Ah. Well, it would appear that Mr. and Mr. Skulkin's testimony has been reliable. For once. You were born Ashley Milverton, then. Is that correct? Very well, yes. So Ashley Graydon was once Ashley Milverton. That information could change things. And could turn out to be extremely important. Yeah, I kind of figured out the Milverton thing like 10 minutes ago as well, because it was the only new information. Good lord. <laughs> all of a sudden, we seem to be up to our necks in a serious matter of national security. Although all this talk about interception of secret government messages is still just conjecture at this stage. It would explain a number of things though, wouldn't it? The negotiation Ginny overheard on the omnibus two months ago, and the break-in at Winterbanks. But the trouble is, it wasn't Mr. Graydon in the omnibus with Mr. McGill did. No, that was Mr. Mason, the brickmaker who was so horribly murdered. Hmm, if only there was some link between the two men somehow. I know, but Mr. Graydon's testimony seems to be as watertight as ever. I wonder if the key to us making headway with the cross-examination here could be those two brothers. I mean, yes it was and yes it is, I just had to go through that at this point. Objection! Mr. Ashley Milverton. Tell me, why did you try to hide your former name from the court? Because I haven't gone by that name for years. It means nothing to me. No, I don't think that's the real explanation at all. The truth is, you had a reason to hide that name. Explain yourself, please, counsel. I have here the notes from the omnibus case, my lord. And as we all know, the victim, the man who we now understand to have been negotiating with Mr. McGill did. Yes, Mr. Mason, the brickmaker. That's right, only Mason wasn't his surname at all. It was his given name. His full name was Mason Milverton. Mil... Milverton? Do, do you mean to say? Saints alive! Mr. Ashley Milverton. 
Is it not the case that the brickmaker, Mr. Mason Milverton, was your father? Oh, I don't! As I believe I mentioned earlier, your family history will have been thoroughly checked when you joined the civil service. And it really would take no time at all for the court to subpoena those records. Ugh. The truth is, you have been illegally acquiring highly confidential government information and selling it onto McGilded in collaboration with your father. Yeah? We've been done now. The new facts and evidence unveiled by the cross-examination of this witness all come together to reveal the truth. The, the truth, you say? That you collaborated with your father, Mr. Mason Milverton, in illegal dealings with Magnus McGilded. By dint of this music box, you mean, Council? Yes. Stealing information being sent in secret government communications and selling it on to McGilded. Mr. Graydon concocted this elaborate scheme of using two music box discs to encode the information. As, presumably, a safety measure against the information falling into the wrong hands. And a very effective one. I shouldn't have given the scheme any credence whatsoever. But the deal with McGilded went sour, and the brickmaker met his end. Yes, but before he was arrested, McGilded managed to temporarily dispose of the stolen disc at the pawnbroker. Then, having learned of the situation, you appeared at Winderbanks two days ago, in an attempt to recover the two articles McGilded had placed in pawn there. But that attempt failed. One of the discs was seized by the police, and the other you never found. So that same night, you enlisted the help of the Skulkin brothers and broke into the pawnbrokery. This time, determined to recover the second disc. Uh, are you suggesting that the second disc was inside the music box? Eh? Wait, we never knew nothing about that. On the night that Mr. Winderbank was killed, The intruder took the pawnbroker, he touched one item and one item alone. The music box. Oh, this is very much a segue, but this was ported from 3DS, wasn't it? I forgot what it released on. And the whole stereoscope thing would have been really good on the 3DS screen. That's why that effect looks familiar, isn't it? It was modelled for the 3DS. That's kind of hilarious. Anyway. It's rather ingeniously demonstrated using the two prints from the security camera, indeed. So, the question that naturally begs answering is this. Why was only that one article disturbed? The answer is obvious, because it contained the second disc which the intruder was desperate to retrieve. Since, if it were to fall into the hands of the police, it would be proof of high treason. Well, Mr. Graydon, do you deny that all of this actually began on that fateful night two months ago? I'm assuming his answer will be yes. I... I... I refuse to accept any of this nonsense. Uh, your arm. Dude, white suit might have been a bad idea. Sir? There appears to be blood seeping through the sleeve of your jacket. What? Ah! Two nights ago. We know that three shots were fired at the scene of the crime in Winderbank's pawnbrokery. One took the life of the pawnbroker himself. One struck the pouch around Mr. Sholmes's waist. And the final bullet. struck the calendar on the wall of the shop, having first pierced the arm of one of the intruders. Mr. Graydon, that wound on your arm that you seem to be trying to hide, it's a bullet wound, isn't it? He's got you now, me old china. Time to call it quits and croak, I reckon. Huh. 
Don't acknowledge my presence there under any circumstances whatsoever. Those were my terms, remember? And I paid you handsomely to comply. Clearly, I was a fool to think I could trust some common backslum thieves. Fine, I admit it. I was there in Winderbanks that night. I paid this pair ten guineas to accompany me. And as you've noticed, I sustained an injury in the course of my adventures. But that is all. I admit to nothing more. Stealing government secrets? Negotiating with Mr. McGilded? As God is my witness, I'm sure I recall nothing of the sort. He's not going to go down without a fight. Not until I can show hard evidence, I suppose. Nevertheless, the defence has now established a crucial fact. Which is... Well, we know that one bullet was fired from each of the two firearms we have in evidence. The bullet from the Skulkin Brothers' gun hit the pouch around Mr. Sholmes' waist. And the bullet from Mr. Winderbank's gun clearly must have been the one that caught Mr. Graydon on the arm. Indeed it must. We can rule out the possibility that the man shot himself. And that leads us to only one conclusion. Mr. Winderbank was shot by a third gun. Which can only have been fired by the third intruder. Goodness! That's right, Mr. Graydon. Ugh. The only person who could have possibly shot Mr. Winderbank that night is you. Hold it! <laughs> you little upstart. You made a grave mistake when you summoned me here. What? What's that supposed to mean? Yes, as you rightly say, I was there at the pawnbrokers. I did my best to hide the fact, naturally. I had no intention of ruining this distinguished career I'd built for myself at the communication station. But did the thought never cross your mind? Did you never consider the possibility? What? Well, what do you mean? What thought? What possibility? The possibility that if I was there at the scene, I may have witnessed the crucial moment. You see... This makes me a key witness in this case, and I have my hands firmly around the neck of your client. What? Uh, are you suggesting? I saw it all. I saw the very moment that pickpocket girl pointed the gun at that poor defenceless pawnbroker and shot him. You... what? Oh, goodbye logic. Well, it would seem we are finally entering the last act of this theatrical trial. Oh, good lord, finally. Mr. Graydon. Yes? I trust you're fully aware of the implications here. If it has shown that your claim is false, you will have incriminated yourself as the killer. Oh, I understand fully. Then I must ask you to give your formal testimony once more. You will explain to the court precisely what you saw at the moment the defendant allegedly shot the victim. Nothing would give me greater pleasure. Woohoo. While these ruffians were jostling with the broker, I was still near the entrance to the shop. When Windebank threw Nash over the counter, I felt a sharp pain in my arm. I pursued the man, but he shut himself in the storeroom. I could see him through the peephole in the door, though. The accused in the black coat shot the man in the back as he was trying to flee to safety. She was wearing a black coat yet. Where is the photo with Gina? Okay, so she was in that photo, but I swear that was the... 
Wasn't there a photo of Gina lying on the floor holding the gun? Somewhere. Because yes, there she's wearing the black coat, but... Well, this is going to annoy me. Anyway, that aside, I saw the blood spatter all over that wretched girl. Then she tossed the gun out to the people, so I picked it up and made my escape. Good gracious, this, this is quite extraordinary testimony. You claim, sir, under oath, to have clearly seen the defendant pulling the trigger. Yeah, not for long. It wasn't my intention to testify in this way. But neither is it my intention to be found guilty of a murder I didn't commit. So you see, my hand has been forced. I tell the truth now as an act of self-preservation. Yeah, sure you do. The truth. Until now, the prosecution was completely unaware of these details. Yes, well, um, sorry about that. Having shot me in the arm, the pawnbroker was then shot in the back by the accused. And as I said, she was showered in his blood. You say the blood shattered over the accused's coat. Are you sure on that point? Oh yes, quite sure. All over the black overcoat that pickpocket girl was wearing at the time. Really? If her coat could somehow be shown to harbour vestiges of blood, that would be conclusive evidence here. Oh dear. That's gonna be a problem. We already know it was because of the McGilded murder. Such an investigation is entirely possible, my lord. What? Only very recently a German scientist had developed a technique to identify human blood. So here's to true science. Not some amateurish detective's dubious foray into the world of chemistry. There's nothing dubious about Hurley's work. His ideas are all sound. Ideas are no use to us here. In science, as in law, theories must be proven before they stand. In Germany, the technique has already been employed in the courtroom as the basis of evidence. Scotland Yard has a small quantity of the chemical reagent used. With your lordship's permission. We could shatter all vestiges of doubt within minutes. Hmm. This doesn't look good, Reno. Why not? Well, we know, don't we? That there's blood all over the front of Ginny's coat. If they test it with their chemicals... Oh, help, you're right. I was forgetting what happened yesterday. Move, Ginny. I'm going to shoot. Yeah, there it is. But that's not Mr. Winterbank's blood. That stain is from two months ago. That's Mr. Mason's blood from when he was stabbed by McGilded, who was wearing the coat at the time. My lord, the defence objects to the task proposed by the prosecution. Overruled. Lord Van Zeeks, make it so at once. With pleasure, my lord. And while we await the results, the defence may proceed with the cross-examination. Oh boy. Once they find that blood on the overcoat, Gina will be... Counsel. Yes, my lord. A cross-examination. Of course, my lord. If this cross-examination doesn't go well, if I don't manage to uncover some decisive evidence or a really compelling clue now, I have a very bad feeling about the outcome of this trial. Yeah, I can't imagine it'll go well. 
I mean, the ending. I'm hoping the cross-examination will go well. Hold it! Mr. Winterbank emerged from the storeroom, I believe. Ringo and Nash were scaring the counter when he suddenly appeared and flew at them. He already had the revolver in his hand. Fortunately, I wasn't too close. I've never been so scared in all my life. Yeah, we're just your regular mild man of burglars, that's all. We don't like violence. Says so the pair who carry a gun. What do you mean when you say you were near the entrance to the shop? I was in the doorway, running my eyes over the shelves of forfeited items. Looking for the music box, of course. The broker went for Nash in the first place. And Ringo joined in, making it two against one, so I assumed they could handle the situation. But I was wrong. I was trying to help me little bruv, but the old geezer chucked me over the plumbing counter. So I pulled my gun on the old fella, and that soon made him scarper. A pair of you setting upon the poor defenceless pawnbroker together. Shame on you! Sorry, Gov. You mean that's the moment you were shot? Yes, no, I didn't immediately realise what had happened, of course. Things crashed to the floor from the counter as the three men were brawling. It was at exactly that moment it happened, so I didn't hear the gunshot. And the bullet went on to strike the calendar in the wall behind you. So it would appear. When I looked at my arm, I saw it was bleeding badly, so I wrapped my handkerchief around it. Seeing as I couldn't explain what had happened to a doctor, I had no choice but to wait for it to heal. I didn't imagine it would still be bleeding two days later. Ugh. Did Mr. Winderbank intend to shoot you, do you think? Well, now, I don't imagine he even noticed I was there, to be honest. Perhaps the gun went off accidentally. Anyway, it didn't quite strike home. When I put my gun on him, he tried to shove me out of the way. And then he scarpered through that door out back. At which point, what did you do? You mean you chased after him? I don't recall the reason why, but I ran after him to the back of the shop. And what about this peephole in the door you mentioned? Well, unsurprisingly, the store and doors a solid job, made of stout wood. There's a small opening about head height that lets you see what's in there from the outside. Actually, I should know that, shouldn't I? I looked through it myself that night. Oh, using his super lawyer memory. Oh, she was wearing the coat, darn it. See how good my super lawyer memory is? And what about you burgling brothers? Did you see what went on through this peephole as well? It not likely, Gov. Didn't see nothing of the sort, Gov. I doubt these two buffoons were even aware of the peephole's existence. So the Skulkin brothers were there, but they didn't see the killing of Mr. Winderbank take place. Hmm. Inside the storeroom, I could see the broker and that young girl standing there. The defendant? Yes, no, neither of them noticed that I was looking. The girl raised her gun and pointed it straight at the man. And then, what did you see next? I mean, I think I know what the issue is here. Because... If he was trying to flee to safety, he wouldn't be facing that way. And she couldn't have shot him in the back left side from where she was. Objection! Oh, darn it. I assume that's the thing we're going to get to, because I'm pretty sure I said at one point that he was shot through the peephole. But, you know... Did I hear you correctly? She threw the gun out of the room. 
That's right. After the broker fell to the floor, she started walking over. Over where, exactly? In the direction of the storeroom door, to where I was watching. Of course, I quickly retreated, and then... The girl dropped the gun through the peephole onto the floor on my side of the door. Why on earth would she do such a thing? I couldn't tell you. Perhaps she was hoping to distance herself from the murder weapon. Without thinking, I went and picked it up. I suppose I was worried about just leaving it there, in case any more tragedies took place. Sure you were. So it was you, in fact, who took the third gun from the scene of the crime. Yes, it was yours truly. Hmm. I left the clear-up to my lackeys and left. Clear-up? We made a bit of a mess around the counter, so Mr. Whistle and Flute here told us to tidy up. He thinks he's our blooming mum sometimes. Well, I was paying you enough, by God. Ugh. Tell me, Mr. Graydon, when you left the pawnbrokery that night, was it by any chance with the second disc in your jacket pocket? You're like a You're bullet a gate, aren't right. you? <laughs> uh. Uh. <laughs> Excuse me. Gentlemen. <laughs> Something wrong, sunshine. That should be my line. You... Do you realise you were just violently shaking Mr. Skulkin? Blimey, this D's a bit of an hooligan, ain't he? What was going on just now? You saw him? He grabbed him, he whistled. Why the blazes, he said. Did you mention the third gun when we got you down the station? And why didn't you? Because we didn't know nothing about it. All that flaming peephole in the door. Um, sorry about that. I can be prone to losing my rag sometimes. Not hurt, are you? God blimey, see the way he's looking at me. I'm telling you, this dig gives me the willies. That was strange. The inspector doesn't normally get quite as worked up as that. He wouldn't normally grab someone. No, that wasn't like Gregsy at all. He's normally your sweetness and light, no matter what I say to him. Yes, well, I think he might be a special case, Iris. Well, anyway, that was definitely out of character. What's your feeling, Bruno? As much as I hate to admit it, I don't see any obvious holes in his testimony at the moment. But you have to find a way to break this man! And quickly too, because once they discover the blood on the overcoat Gina was wearing... It's a bit strange that he's so sure of himself about seeing the blood spatter over Ginny's coat. It doesn't strike me as the sort of thing you claim if you hadn't genuinely seen it happen. But we know that Gina didn't shoot Mr. Winderbank, so what's going on? Did he witness the McGilded murder? All I know is it's very unfair. Why should some German scientist test be acceptable as evidence when mine and Hurley's wasn't? Detectives could use test tubes too. Never mind that. I have to find a really stark inconsistency in that testimony somewhere. And I have to find it before the prosecution discovers the bloodstain on Gina's coat. Okay, there's one thing I didn't press, so... Maybe two things. Hold it! Yes, when the crime is discovered, the defendant was found with a gun in her hand. But that was Mr. Winderbag's gun, from which only a single bullet had been fired. And as we've already established, Mr. Graydon, that bullet was fired at you. Ah, but no, it wasn't the broker's gun that pickpocket girl had when I saw her. Yes, the bullet from Winterbank's gun grazed my arm, and yes, the Skulkin's gun grounded the detective. But this was another gun entirely. A third gun. The broker's gun was not the murder weapon, so clearly there had to be a third firearm involved. In other words, the accused must have had her own gun with her at the time. Objection! But no other gun was found at the scene. <laughs> Calm yourself, counsel. Sorry. You must consider the events in order. 
first I saw the broker and the girl glaring at each other, but then all of a sudden, the broker turned to run. And it was at that moment that the little gutter rat shot him in the back. A chilling image, I must say. Hold it! All, all over her? Yes, through the peephole I saw it clearly. Of course, the stains are invisible now, what with the coat being such a dark colour. Oh, hang on. A bullet wound to the back. And if she was shooting from behind him, the blood wouldn't have gone onto her. Ha. Huh. Of course, the stains are invisible now, what with the coat being such a dark colour. But I assure you, that garment is sullied with the victim's blood. Since Gregson was being weird, I wonder if I can do the thing again where I randomly pursue Excuse me. just to see what's on his mind. Is something wrong, Inspector? Inspector Gregson? I can't be here. I haven't got time to stand around in the blooming stand. Oh. I need to get back to the yard. Who knows what's kicking off while I'm swanning around here. Are you referring to the emergency you've been talking about since yesterday? I haven't been talking about anything but the saw. That's a top secret assignment, that is. Says the detective at full volume in the courtroom with the public gallery. Well, well, well anyway, the point is you need to get this trial over and done with as quickly as possible. Oh, come on! This clearly makes sense. Oh, walk through it is. Good lord. Okay, it looks like I don't even have to present anything during this. Hold it! I just have to press everything and then do the thing, but because I hadn't pressed everything yet, it didn't trigger. Because, you know... Assuming I'm doing this in the right place now, because it wouldn't surprise me to learn I wasn't. Okay, yeah, this is the right one. I guess you were meant to press them all in order and then get to this. Loud sighing. Oh wait, this is different. You won't admit to anything unless I can thrust the evidence in his face. Ha ha ha. It's not as easy as you thought, is it, to pin a crime on this lapel? Ha <laughs> ha. It won't stick. Not murder. Not treason. Maybe not right now, but you won't be sniggering like that forever. Oh, for goodness sake. Why is this game so infuriating sometimes? It doesn't seem to be triggering. I really hope that I haven't messed it up by going out of order. Because if I have, I'm going to be in trouble. Right, I'm going to press everything again. This might take me a minute, but I guess this is all I have. Oh, okay, I finally got everything. Good lord. Literally all I did while I was gone was press buttons for five minutes and get no new information. Slightly infuriating, but this game is what it is. My lord. Requesting your lordship's permission to interrupt the cross-examination. Explain yourself, officer. I have results of the test that was ordered earlier, my lord. Ah, the blood on the accused's overcoat. Thank you, officer. Very well. The cross-examination is hereby temporarily suspended. I presume you have no objection, counsel. Um, no, my lord. Well, 
Well, there you have it. The report, please, Inspector. Yes, sir. Traces of human blood were found on the overcoat of the defendant, Miss Gina Lestrade. From the extent of the stains, it would appear that they were the result of spattering following a gunshot wound. End of report. Goodness me. See? What did I tell you? Objection! No, the blood on that coat is not Mr. Winderbanks. What on earth makes you say that, Council? The coat originally belonged to Magnus McGilded. Just before his coat was deposited at Winderbanks, McGilded had fatally stabbed Mr. Mason Milverton. So the blood on that overcoat is the blood of the brickmaker from the omnibus case. Objection! Well, dead cannot speak. Isn't that right, my friend? Sorry? Two months ago, in this very courtroom, did you not argue fervently for McGilded's innocence? And yet, now that the man is dead, you brand him as a murderer. Your conduct shatters any shed of responsibility you may have earned for yourself in this country. Ugh, but, but that was... I call it a bally disgrace. Treachery, that's what it is. Hmm, how to determine whether the blood on that coat is two months old or not? Even a stereoscope couldn't help the odds to that problem prop out. It can't be done! But... but... We use Mr. Shorn's especially formulated... Mr. Shorn's a detective, not a chemist. Would you put such faith in a chemical formula devised by me, for example, when I'm a communications officer? I held out Prosky's starving boy and he ran away crying. Herlock Sholmes is barely more than a figment of the public's imagination. His name carries no weight in this courtroom. No weight at all. How could you say that? Victory is sweet indeed. This proves that my testimony is the whole truth from start to finish. How do you arrive at such a conclusion, sir? As the witness said, the accused's coat was scattered with the blood of the victim. The only way Mr. Graydon could possibly have known that fact is if he saw it happen. In other words, his testimony is solid and the conclusion is singular. It was the accused who shot the victim in this case. That is the whole truth. That's not terribly helpful. My lord! Be a long battle this one, but this old war has something to say now, if you please. Mr. Foreman? As of this moment, sir, the squadron has reached its final decision. Ready, men? All for one now. Guilty. 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 Yeah, saw that coming. Well, it would appear the ladies and gentlemen of the jury have reached a unanimous verdict. Don't make me do another one of the jurist thingies. This episode's already getting long. The defence has consistently failed to unpick this witness's testimony. Here's to any attempt you may make to unpicking the jury's decisions being equally successful. Ugh. Ugh. I don't believe it. After I've come so far. How is it all unravelling on me so fast? How oh, very distressing. To be held in such low esteem. Wouldn't you agree, Mr. Narahodo? Officer? You've delivered the report now. That will be all, thank you. It occurs to me with some regularity, Mr. Narahodo. The scientific truths are determined not by science, but by none other than the human mind. I, I know that voice. Am I going mad? 
Ah! Hey! <laughs> Mr. Sholmes! Oh, Gregson's face. That's such a mood. What? What is the meaning of this? Oh, that pose. What an icon. What business do you have here, detective? Last I heard, you were recuperating in hospital. As, w as well I would be, had I not been sent upon an errand. What errand? Pearly, it's really you! You're awake at last! Yes, good day, Iris. I appear to be rather late to rise. My apologies. Now, my lord, if you would humour me. In what manner, sir? I have something of great importance I wish to give to the young lawyer over there. I need no more than five minutes. Would you be so kind as to spare us the time? Hmm. What say you to this, Lord Van Zeeks? This trial has taken many hours of the court's time, having spent so long already. Exactly. I haven't spent so long already, we don't want to go wasting any more precious time. As I was saying, having spent so long already, it would seem churlish to deny the defence a mere five minutes. Yeah. Very well then. Cancel, you have five minutes. Thanks, Sholmes. My dear fellow, I apologise for my tardy arrival. Mr. Sholmes, are you all right now? <laughs> all right, I'm all wrong. Sorry. I've only just managed to summon the strength to stand, man. I asked the judge for five minutes. But I fear even that may prove too much for me. Pray forgive me, should I pass out? Um, let's make this discussion as short as possible. Holy, this place is full of idiots! I mean, mood. None of them can see how wonderful your chemical blood analysis is! Ah, oh, well, that concoction of mine was really just a bit of sport to assist me in my investigations. I never took the trouble to refine it for appraisal by the scientific community. An oversight on my part. Right. Modesty? Surely not. But enough of that. I'm here to give you this, my dear fellow. What's that? A lavender furoshiki wrapping. A leaving present from Miss Suzato. From Miss Suzato. If possible, matters would be settled without me giving you this. Those were her instructions when she asked me to do her this favour. I... I don't understand. Mrs. Zato foresaw today's events, I believe. She knew that the culprit would attempt to escape justice by means both devious and underhanded. And that you, Mr. Narahodo, fighting fairly as you are wont to do, would find yourself in considerable peril. At that very moment of crisis, you would be given this small parcel. Those were the dear lady's instructions. A leaving present from Suzato san. Whatever could it be? What is this? Oh! It's it's the machine I made! Ah. Oh. Oh. Look! I used this! It's my latest invention! What? What is that? I call it Cat Flapper Mat. We can make a cat flap for a little furry friend like Waggy in seconds! I know what went down. What's Susie up to? Mrs. Zato muttered the following words before she left. I'm a failure. I don't deserve to be a judicial assistant. What? Didn't she say something like that? You really are the best judicial assistant in the world. Well, that's extremely flattering. But I'm sorry to say... ...that I've been a complete failure. Whatever did she mean by that, Mr. Sholmes? That night, when you left Winterbanks in pursuit of the thieves. 
Mr. Zato made use of this contraption for a certain purpose. That is your answer, dear fellow. Not not at all cryptic, then. Suzato san used this cat flipper mat that night. But why? <sighs> I can't believe it's come to this. Your five minutes is over. We're out of time already. I'm grateful to you for affording us that brief recess, Mr. Reaper. I need no thanks, detective. After all, the die is cast. Is it really? The juries are unanimous in their leanings. No doubt my friend will consider a summation examination. But any attempts to alter the verdict now would be utterly futile. I wonder. Mr. Narahodo. Yes? The rest is down to you, dear fellow. What is your plan? The rest is down to me. I need to be careful here. If I make a wrong move, the trial will end. Badly. My lord, the defence requests. I believe I know what the answer is, but I've been recording for a long time this episode. We'll see how long the next part goes. It might not make another full one, but just in case it does. I'm sorry about the cliffhanger, but you've waited this long. I'm sure you can wait a little longer. So thank you so much for watching, and until next time, goodbye.